Today we talk to a Ball State professor who specializes in the documentation of churches in Agia, Greece. There's a preview of the Ball State cheerleading squad that is heading for a national competition in Florida. Our third guest will be addressing health issues important to women. Dr. John Kumalides, Ball State history professor, has spent his summers researching and documenting church art in northern Greece. He's the co-author of Churches of a Gear in Larissa. And this is a very beautiful coffee table type book that has been published. And uh, Dr. Kumalides, you told me it's been uh, going quite well, especially during the Christmas season. Well, it has uh, considerable appeal to individuals with interest in art, especially the post-Byzantine period, 1453 to 1821, and an appeal to in people interested in ecclesiastical architecture. And uh, because of its many illustrations, about 40, uh, 62 color illustrations. Let's show some of those illustrations. They're just breathtaking. Uh, these are the frescoes that are in the They're the side. frescoes of the uh, 12 churches described in the book. And it has uh, 43 architectural drawings. Uh, the churches, uh, each church has been described, given its history, and uh, representative examples of its art, its frescoes, as well as architectural drawings of uh, the structure. Where did you become interested in the churches and why? Well, it was uh, in 1965, I was visiting the area as a student from Cambridge, England, and uh, visited this monastery, a uh, 15th century monastery. It was used as a stable. And in my naivete then as a student, but also my romantic love for the monastery, I thought it might be a good thing to do something and restore it. Did this monastery have frescoes? This monastery has frescoes. And in 1969, a year after I arrived at Ball State University, I was uh, uh, honored by being given the permit to restore the monastery. And I did restore the monastery, and a book was published about it. And uh, then, furthermore, to proceed to catalog and photograph all of the churches in this district. And the district is made up of 12 villages. And just the district alone, or the township of Agia, has 17 churches and three monasteries, one cave chapel with 12th century paintings. And the book itself uh, deals with uh, 12 uh, selective churches at the township of Agia. And many of these churches were allowed to fall in disrepair? Well, most of them, they range between the 15th and 19th century. So one of the problem is the timing. They have aged. The other uh, is that they have uh, not been given any maintenance, any proper attention. Indeed, two of the churches, registered, photographed, and cataloged, uh, have been demolished by Let's natural causes. Let's take a look at uh, some of your work through slides. These are your photographs. Yes. Well, the first one is the sign we made when we started the project, uh, indicating that this project was under the auspices of Ball State University. And the slide you're seeing now uh, presents the monastery uh, of St. Panteleimon, which I helped restore. Is that your first restoration that project? That was my first restoration project. That's the one you found as a student? Yes, and there is the first stage of the monastery uh, as it was found in 1965, and then the second slide shows Ball State University students in the summer of 1969 working in the conservation. How many students would work on your project? I had, uh, in 69, I had four, in 70, I had three, and the and this is the one of the frescoes showing uh, God the Father in, in one of the vaults of the monastery. It looks very early. What period? That is uh, the, uh, 1620. 
and uh, architectural drawings were made of each one of the monuments. And this is an floor plans and uh, cross sections. Other uh, monuments are not as eminent like this one. This uh, uh, church looks like a church. And when we, I saw the priest going in, I thought it might be a church. And indeed, it was a church. And although the exterior looks uh, very unimpressive, as you enter these uh, undistinguished churches, they are richly decorated with most impressive wall paintings, as you will see. Have you had any problems uh, entering the churches? No. Uh, once we were granted permit from the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sciences, the Office of Antiquities and Reconstruction, and we also uh, worked in cooperation with the curator of monuments of the region. Now, there, these are very lovely frescoes, and if not cared for, would have uh, completely deteriorated. Uh, the deterioration happens all the time, war as well as pollution. Fortunately, in the provinces of Greece, the problem of pollution is rather limited. And you have architectural drawings of the church you've just seen. Another very remote church. Yet there are beautiful frescoes within the... But the uh, architectural drawings, they're richly illustrated inside. Then you have various architectural drawings. The screen in one of the churches, richly carved wood and decorated with impressive icons or religious images. And the exterior of this church looks like what? It looks like a... a Try a, a square building. Uh, yeah, well, for example. This one looks more, uh, we thought it was uh, a chicken coop. But actually, this is a small chapel. And as you go inside, as you will see next, it has a beautiful painting. Well, why, why don't I mean, they the have... The exterior is very misleading. Why, why is that? Because between 1453 and 1821, uh, Greece was under Turkish occupation. And the Turkish masters of the Greeks did not allow them to build churches in the grandiose scale style of the Byzantine. So they allowed to build humble structures, but they were free to illustrate them richly in the interior. I see. Now, I understand that uh, through your efforts, you co-authored this book. That uh, it, the, anyone dealing with uh, ancient monuments must work with uh, the curator of, of monuments of the area. So the co-author is the legal approval with the Greek authorities. And His name has to appear in any publication. But the work, in essence, is yours. The work, uh, to a major extent, is mine. And the, the book is being considered for a major uh, recognition. In uh, April of 1985, when it was published, the, uh, the publisher submitted to the Academy of Athens that prestigious and ancient organization of Greece for consideration for a prize. The appropriate committee of the academy then sent the book out to various scholars asking for the review and critique. Once the critiques arrived, then the committee, based upon the reviews and critiques, made a very strong recommendation to uh, recommending the book for a prize for its scholarship and its major contribution to preservation of the Greek heritage. Actually, today, the the entire membership of the Academy of Athens is to vote on the recommendations of the committee. They tell me that usually 99% the membership uh, approves the committee's recommendation. If that happens, such an honor will be, me, be not only an honor to me individually, but it is also an honor and recognition to the work of the Friends of Greek Studies, the various families in Munson, Indiana, that made this work possible because without the financial and moral support, my work in Greece would have been impossible. So the whole work actually should be dedicated to the Friends of Greek Studies. Good. And we certainly uh, say you're most deserving of that honor. Thank you, Dr. John Kumalides, Thank you very much for you. sharing your research in Greece with us. We'll return in just a moment and take a look at Ball State University's varsity cheerleading squad. The Ball State University Varsity Cheerleading Squad has been named one of the top 20 cheerleading ensembles in the nation by the National Cheerleaders Association. This 15-member group is now eligible to compete for one of five awards to be given in Orlando, Florida in January. Judy Abramson, Ball State faculty advisor, 
talks with us about this award-winning group that you see at football and basketball games. Uh, Judy, how did the Ball State Varsity Cheerleading Squad become one of the top 20 in the country? In uh, early November, they submitted a tape of a routine which they had been working on that included a um, cheer, uh, some chants, a dance routine, and it all had to be choreographed and put together within three minutes. And so when they uh, did this and had it videotaped, they sent the videotape in to the National Cheerleaders Association. And then they were judged out of about somewhere between 100 and 200 other squads, and they select 20 to come down to Florida to compete. Well, they could rest on their laurels now, couldn't they? That's right. Uh, 20 out of uh, 200 is, is quite an achievement. That's right. Um, what does the competition mean for them? Well, uh, I think it means a lot just to Ball State because many of the other schools are uh, major athletic powers and um, our Big Ten, Big Eight schools. Louisville and uh, Ball State and a small junior college in Texas are three of the 20. And um, so it means that our cheerleaders are at a uh, competition level and a skill level that's very high. And uh, to be recognized by this association is a um, a real honor and they will get a free trip to Florida and get to stay in Disney World although I'm afraid that while they're there they won't have much time to see <laughs> Disney World but uh, then they will be competing while they're down there and have it having it taped for television promotion later. Yesterday we were at your rehearsal and we took some video which we'd like to show the audience now. Is this the sort of thing that, that they do at the games, or is this a little uh, extra? This is a little extra. <laughs> uh, we have some constraints put on the cheerleaders uh, for safety reasons by the Mid-American Conference. And so um, the height and some of the stunts they cannot do at the ball games. But they will uh, be judged on how difficult the stunts are in Florida. And the skill level has to be very high. Um, all the squads, I'm sure, will be very good, and they, it's like a one-time uh, thing, if they make everything and hit everything just right, then they will do very well. And uh, But most of this you don't see at the ball games. You may see a few of the cheers, but uh, they plan on presenting their whole program on January 2nd at the halftime of the ball game. Who did the choreography? It was done by a young man who was a cheerleader at Indiana State at one time, uh, Rossi Mills. And uh, he is 
helped a lot of squads with this competition and at one time has worked for the National Cheerleading Association. So he knows basically what it takes to win the competition. Now they'll be practicing two, three hours a day right up until... Oh yes, and especially on the weekends they're practicing probably almost six to eight hours a day. Now I know that there are uh, students and potential Ball State students uh, watching us that would be interested in cheerleading. What do you look for when selecting members of the squad? Well they try out in the spring and uh, they must do some uh, cheerleading jumps, uh, they do gymnastics, uh, they have to do an original cheer, uh, but most of the individuals that we see at this level are have cheerleading experience and are very good and a lot of it is stage presentation and how well they project and uh, show their pep and energy. Like how many openings do you have on the squad? Uh, usually we have had about um, oh, six to eight, but this year we've gone to having one squad which participates all year long and we have a second squad that helps to support some of the uh, more minor sports or not revenue pr producing sports and so that has allowed us to have a lot more people get experience. And a lot of competition for those six to eight openings. Yes, but I've seen some high schools that the competition has been even greater because I think a lot of students get to uh, college and they don't know that um, they don't think about trying out and they think there will be a lot more people. Normally it's somewhere between uh, 55 and 80 people trying out, which is not a whole lot for a school this size. Good luck. Thank you. At your competition, which will be just in a few days in That's Florida. That's right. Thank you so much for being with us. Judy Abramson, Ball State Faculty Advisor for the uh, Varsity Cheerleader Group going to Orlando for a national competition. In just a moment, we're going to talk about health issues of importance to women. Toxic shock syndrome was recently back in the news after many of us thought it had been taken care of with research and publicity. To talk with us about some interesting new research in this area and other medical problems facing today's woman is Dr. Denise Amschler, Ball State Physiology and Health Science Professor. Uh, that was a very unfortunate incident, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It brought to mind the immediacy, again, for women to be more aware of toxic shock and how to prevent it. It uh, trickled off for a while in the news, and we sort of got complacent about it, but it is still with us. And then, of course, we're talking about the young Ball State student who died. Yes, that is right. We lost one, and everyone was very saddened by it. Mm -hmm. how, how can women protect themselves? This. Well, I think knowledge about the nature of the syndrome would be helpful as well as a knowledge of what risk factors to look for and just some common sense behaviors regarding their use of certain items, particularly tampons as well as even contraceptive sponges. But we're talking in essence uh, about a bacteria. Yes, we are. Uh, most people are familiar with the Staphylococcus bacteria. This is a particular strain of it called the Staphylococcus aureus. And it is a common bacteria. It is found often on the skin and uh, in the nose and the throat and in women's vaginas. So it is not something that is highly unusual. The big question is how does its growth get promoted? Uh, the toxin is what is so lethal when it's in sufficient amounts and what promotes the growth of that toxin and what allows it to get into the bloodstream and wreak such devastating effects on the body. And there are a lot of different theories about that. The first one had to do with the Rely tampon that was on the market in the late 70s. Of course, we, Rely was immediately withdrawn when the problem started occurring, but we've had about 2,500 cases of toxic shock between 1979 and 1984 with several hundred deaths. So we know that other tampons are involved, particularly we think the, the ones that are more absorbent. Uh, we've had looked at a lot of different theories about it. One feeling is that extra absorbency blocks airflow and blocks normal flow of, say, menstrual fluid, it provides a good growth medium for, for bacteria that might already be present. There is another feeling that certain materials that are used in the manufacturing of, of tampons, particularly those that are made with synthetic substances, 
uh, not too long ago, the um, substance polyacrylate was withdrawn from some tampons. There was a certain manufacturer actually that pulled these off the shelf and, re and redid them with a different fiber because it was uh, felt that the synthetic materials perhaps were a greater irritant to tissues and perhaps opened them up to lower resistance and allowed the staph aureus to get into the system. Same thing um, has been said about applicators. Plastic applicators being more abrasive to tissues than cardboard ones. Uh, how about uh, <laughs> calcium? Uh, let's move to another topic, uh, which is very much in the news uh, and of, of great concern to women. And we hear about uh, increasing calcium intake. Oh yes, definitely. It's uh, it's something that's gotten a lot of publicity lately. Something I I'm very personally concerned about with my students because we know now that between the years of, of 15 and 35, we are putting on our massive. Uh, bone density, our peak bone density. And so if you're in that age group, you still still have an excellent opportunity to uh, make your bones as, as hard as possible through calcium intake. And the big concern is that perhaps our recommended daily allowances for women for daily calcium intake have been too low. And previously they were set at 800 milligrams a day. Now we're looking at between maybe 1,000 and 1,200 milligrams a day for premenopausal women and as much as 14 to 1500 milligrams a day for postmenopausal women. And of course the best way to do this is to get more dairy products into your diet. They're the ideal source of calcium because they also contain vitamin D and you have to have vitamin D to metabolize uh, calcium. So they're the ideal primary source. And uh, it's really not that difficult. If you like milk, you have it made because a glass of milk has about 300 milligrams of calcium. And of course, the, the bottom line of all this is to try to lower one's risk of osteoporosis. And that is a major concern of, of women as they age, as they hit menopausal years. Their estrogen levels cut back, which speeds up the demineralization of the bones. And osteoporosis can be very debilitating. It is a silent disease in the early stages. And unfortunately, many women wait until it's too late to try to do something about it when what they're trying to do at that point will only be of limited value. It will certainly help, but it would not do as much as if they had started earlier in life. And they should start, uh, tell us once again. Yes, definitely. Between the ages of 15 and 35, you need calcium to build peak bone mass and then after that you need calcium all through the rest of your life to repair the bones as they break down. So there's never a time that you don't need calcium. How about our calcium in capsule form? Calcium supplements are available and of course many manufacturers have jumped on the bandwagon as the interest has peaked. And we really don't recommend that as your primary source because you never know if you're getting enough vitamin D. Some calcium supplements don't provide you with the right kind of calcium. If your doctor recommends a calcium supplement or you know that there is just no way you're going to get it dietarily, make sure that you choose a form that contains calcium carbonate because it contains the highest percent of calcium, which is about 40%. And I might also add that one of the cheapest sources of calcium carbonate is in Tums. Consumer Reports did a, a comparison survey not long ago and they found that Tums contain uh, a substantial amount of calcium carbonate. But beware of certain supplements because some calcium supplements contain toxic materials that could actually make you sick, like lead for example. Mm -hmm. Which you think would almost be banned. Well, you would think so, but, <laughs> but they are available. The yes, uh, you know, the consumer must beware. But we still feel that the dietary forms are very important. And along with calcium intake, exercise, because exercise will help your body know where to distribute the calcium. And where you put on the most stress on your bones is where you will develop the greatest hardness, which of course you need calcium to do. So. Exercise all parts of your body, not just some parts of the body. Do it now, do it through the rest of your life, and it will, it will not guarantee that you don't have osteoporosis, but it will certainly reduce your risk, which is very worthwhile doing. You look like a prime example of what a woman should look like in the prime of health. <laughs> Do you follow your own advice? Yes, I do, but I, I'm fortunate and then I grew up drinking milk and I love milk and I love all dairy products and, and pizza with cheese <laughs> and there's a zillion ways to get calcium in the diet. 
yes, and I do exercise. I, I take aerobics classes three days a week. And um, my grandmother has osteoporosis. My mother has not been a milk drinker, and now she's trying to make amends for all of those years. So I look at those two generations, and I, I hope to, to do just a little bit more to offset my risk. Yours is the beginning of a new generation. Well, let's hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Denise Amschler sharing some of the uh, women's health issues with us on Ball State today. Thank you.